this Friday. We're trying to keep up on Piazza. I, I do want to comment that uh, I was, in the beginning, I was sort of resistant to giving you PDFs of my displays because I wanted you to think about it and try different things. For some of them, uh, like for the do it yourself, what was it, 1D, you'll get slightly, you might get different answers depending on if you if you restricted the number of words. Um, I'm happy to look at, um, look at the code and look at the display. For the, um, for the word to vec one, um, there were parameters in the word to, I'm going to talk about word to vec today. There were parameters that maybe changed. The number of edits, which I didn't tell you about. But um, uh, I'll explain how that works today. And you can think about uh, trying different things. And any, any reasonable answer you've made reasonable choices is get good credit. Um, sometimes people have some misunderstandings, but most, most people think you get it. Okay. No concerns, no questions? Okay. Good. Um, I do want to mention that I don't have a <laughs> note here. Tomorrow, I'll put a, I'll put a note on the uh, piazza. Tomorrow at 12 o'clock in CDS, or I'm not sure, sixth floor, I'm not sure, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, a friend of mine from, uh, which I've known for a long time, uh, Kathy Jo Martin, who works in political science, she's been using, like everybody else in the world, uh, computer science techniques in her, in her uh, research. And she does uh, cultural issues, she's a political scientist, but she's using natural language processing to do some of her work. I think you have to reserve space. I, I'm going to go. Uh, but take a look. And I'm asking her if also if she has some ideas for projects. Um, she might want to get some people on board, maybe even in the spring. I don't know. I asked her if, you know, how we could uh, how we could connect up with her and the things she's doing. So come by and see what she's doing. She's a very nice person, very smart. Uh, okay. So what I want to start with, I'm going to do two things today. Um, I'm going to talk about generative models with RNNs. And uh, in particular, we're going to add some refinements that I didn't, we could have put in last time. And in fact, I'm going to show you an implementation that I made of the generative model with uh, Ngram. But it's orthogonal, I mean, it's just a feature. It's called beam search, and it's used to improve the quality of answers. Basically, search for uh, a sentence that have a, uh, more properties that you like, and we'll look at that. And then I want to talk about word embeddings, and uh, we'll continue perhaps with that a little bit next time. But um, the idea of embeddings, which you're using in the current assignment, I think is fairly straightforward, but. Um, Let's look at, we're going to look in detail at how word to vec does it. Okay, that's the one that is the end of um, problem one. I'm not going to talk about glove embedding. I, I, I could next time, maybe I could use a little bit of that. But um, they're, they're behaved a little differently. But anyway, so just remember where we are. All these different models, sequence to sequence in the homework, which I'm writing for you. Uh, we're going we're gonna to test out this with um, part of speech tagging. We're going to compare it with hidden Markov models. I'm going to give you an implementation of hidden Markov models. And you're going to run it probably just on the brown corpus. I'll see if I can find something more interesting. That's already got tags in it. Um, we'll see what I can find. Um, we also have uh, vector to sequence, which we're going to look at today. 
and uh, sequence to vector. And starting next time, we're going to start to look at leading into the notion of transformers, which are based on this kind of idea. Um, but the idea of a context vector, which is sent between these two modules, the input comes in, it's compiled down to, in some sense, to a context vector. That is sent to a decoder, which then loops around and generates a sentence. So we're going to look at this part today and talk about how this thing works. But keep in mind this idea of a context vector, which you can pretty much think of as being the, um, the memory of the recurrent network. Okay. So remember that uh, in the LSTM, and we're going to use LSTM. They tend to work better for products like ours. Remember that, I, want to, I mentioned this last time, but I want to emphasize. Um, in some sense, there's one loop or pathway, which is the memory. And it's called context uh, in many of the implementations. And so basically, there's a there's bits flying around, you know, a vector or it could be very large, flying around. And in the LSTM, there are basically, there are little sub-neurons with their own weight matrices which figure out uh, how to erase things from the memory, that's the forget gate. How to write to memory, that's the update gate. How to calculate an output which comes out here based on the, uh, the input, and the output gate, which determines how much of the memory is used to do the current activation. So there's a lot of, uh, as I said, that was the first, that was the earliest design, and they simplified it in various ways. But it's still one that's very, very useful. We're going to use it. So keep in mind, then, that in some sense, there's a, there's a path with the activations, and in the models we're going to look at today, generative models, you would input the start, this, the, the initial activation coming in uh, is the memory is zero. I didn't put that here, but all zeros, so there's nothing in memory. Then you input the start symbol, that's the input, a vector, right? And then you generate a word. That's the activation. Then the context vector, the memory, is recording something based on what happened in the past. And then this loops around. You put it back in. The context and the activation come back. And now you're going to generate another word and remember something, generate another word. But you constantly take this word and put it back in. So until you generate the end of start, the end of sentence. So how do you train it? You train it on sequences because now we have sequences. So uh, so long and thanks for all the fish break into equal size subsequences. Here uh, we'll do five, but typically you do longer. If you think about those, uh, you know, essentially, you can remember as long as the sequence is. It's not exactly that way. Um, you can remember very long distance. Um, in principle, it can remember that there was an open parentheses and it has to close it at some point. And it can go beyond the end of the sequence. But um, basically, you break it into n grams. Think of it that way, right? Pentagrams. And then you simply take, and typically what you're going to do is do this. If you're generating sentences, you're going to do sentences. You're going to grab a sentence and break it into end grams. Right? And then so you train it that if you give it S, so long, and thanks, it should output an appropriate representation from a soft max or something like that. So long, and thanks for the next, the next piece of the sequence shifted by one. 
Then when you give it that one, it should give you the next overlapping sequence. Then when you give it that one, it, so you keep shifting it to predict. This is just training, right? That it will predict basically a new word given this context. And so you can think of it as doing something kind of like what the engram did, right? Because you have a prefix and it's got to generate the next word. And then you add that to the prefix and you generate the next word. And so in some sense, it's behaving like an engram. Notice that it, it would be a little harder to do bidirectional here. You know, because how could you, you don't have the rest of the sense. You're focusing on generating that word and you don't have the following context. So that, it, it's really a one-dimensional kind of a process. I mentioned this last time. You use some kind of uh, loss function here. We use law of loss, so we're going to add them together. And basically, um, you, uh, you just calculate this, you know, what happens as you go along and as you generate. Uh, you accumulate the error, and that's what you use to train. Now, it's a complicated thing to think about because the fact that this was not quite right means that you have something coming in here that's not quite right. So, the back propagation through time is very complicated. It's got to figure out, you're propagating the errors, right? If this is not right, then you're giving it something which isn't quite right here. You see, it's, it's complicated. It takes quite a long time. The back propagation through time adds a lot of complication here. Um, the other question is whether when you started out, do you just give it the start symbol? Well, sort of, yeah, that'll work. But sometimes people find that it works better if they give it a, a context. They'll randomly select a context from the corpus, and they'll put it in at that length, and then it, then it will go off. So there's a lot of different approaches here. But for, for now, we can just think of it as you give it the, in, the start symbol, and it keeps generating sequences. It'll generate a sentence until it gets to the um, until it gets to the end of sentence symbol. Now, there's a couple of issues with generating sentences. Um, maybe the one, first one that would occur to you is yes. It will be. It will be when we get to the next months. This is a little lower level. Um, I'm thinking of a context, and you're going to do this in the homework, where you might give it a start symbol, start of sentence, and it generates, then it generates a sequence of words. Or you give it a character, and it generates a series of characters. Right? Now, in principle, uh, you could train it on different kinds of sentences. Start symbols for Shakespeare. Start symbols for Jane Austen. Start symbols for Milton's Paradise Lost. Start symbols for Java programs. <laughs> you know, and it could generate different kinds of sentences. So your input, it depends on how you train it. You could just train it that way. Right? There could be different kinds of sentences that you want to generate. Um, but to get into generating a sentence that follows another sentence. Um, I'll, talk, I'll start to talk about that next time. But that's a much more complicated thing. What is, what is a whole sentence? Um, give it a sentence and it generates another sentence? Yeah, sort of. But there, there are better ways to think about it when we get to transformers. Good question. Uh, the appropriate question, right? Because how do, you, how do you lift this up to a higher level? Oh, it's storing something. It, it is searching in 
if you remember, the, the way we'd like to think of this is that it does something rational. And I, I've said this before, like with, if you look at vision models, you know, you'd like to think that like in the brain, they've discovered regions of the brain, certain, it'll recognize certain parts of your visual cortex will recognize horizontal lines and vertical lines and circles, and they'll, and they'll start putting higher level representations together. But when people have actually looked at what neural networks do in vision, they don't do any such thing. Because they search in this high dimensional space for an optimal solution, and that's not necessarily the one they're gonna find. Uh, I'm not enough of an authority on neuroscience to talk about the brain structure, but it's just a huge problem. What are these things doing? And we're gonna talk about embeddings today. What do, what do they mean? What do embeddings mean? There are some clues, and I'll talk about it, but it's really hard to say. It's learning a representation. It's learning to produce, to approximate a function. How it does it is a little hard to say. Let's keep thinking about that. Two good questions. Two perfect questions. Okay, so this problem, kind of addressing what you were asking. Um, the RNN makes local decisions, or the n-gram modeling, makes local decisions about the most likely next word. But if, if you think of the n-gram moving across, it only has a certain amount of context to choose the next word, and then it chooses the next word, and then it chooses the next word. It only has a certain amount of context. Okay, <coughs> in principle, the RNN has lots of context, but the problem with that <coughs> propagation through time, this complicated process, it has less and less information as it goes backward. It can't remember everything. Um, it's not going to necessarily find the globally most likely sentence. And in any way, what is the, what is the most likely sentence mean? Probably one most likely sentence. You generate all possible sentences as one that's most likely. Remember what we did was, and this is, a, this is something you have to think about. If you train one of these recursive recurrent models, Again, like we did with the engrams, you don't want it to gen generate the most likely sentence, and then you get one freaking sentence out of it, and that's it. So you have to do a, a you have to essentially choose probabilistically the next sentence based on the likelihood of the next sentence words that are going to follow that engram. This is what we did, right? And there's a, a lot of different methods to change what's called the temperature of the uh, of the, of the probability distribution. Hotter temperatures, meaning it boosts the more likely ones, cooler, makes them closer to a uniform distribution. There's lots of tricks that are used to do that. Okay, and we didn't play around with that very much. We'll do a little bit of that in the next homework. But it, there's a lot of issues here in terms of how does it generally generate a sentence that you want. Well, let's just think then about a different way, a broader, maybe a more global way of searching for an appropriate sentence, such that we can apply other criteria than just the next word. Okay? So it's called beam search. It's been around for a very long time. It's been part of AI for decades. Um, and here's the idea. The idea is that you know, you have a searchlight, you're searching for appropriate sentences, and you'll broaden your search by a factor of n. n is going to be the width of the beam. It's essentially going to be the n most likely sequences. For instead of generating one sentence at a time, we're going to essentially generate n at a time. Okay? We'll, get, we'll keep candidates in a candidate queue. It's going to be a priority queue. And there's going to be a competition, cutthroat competition among these sentences. And some are going to live and some are going to die. Um, 
So n is, you'll, I'm going to show you examples of this, and I'll show you my code or what happens in my uh, implementation. It's n grams, but the same idea. Uh, n is the number of candidates in your queue. You're going to pick an expansion factor, and what that means is for each sentence, you're going to try m different completions. Now remember, you're choosing the next one probabilistically according to the probability distribution for the next word. You set m. You're going to extend each sequence with m new words. They could be the same, could be different, that's fine. We'll see. Um, we have some metric of what sentences are good, okay? In other words, a quality metric, it could be uh, certainly perplexity is one that's natural, but it can be other ones too. And I'm going to talk about them. And you start off with the start symbol. At each iteration, you extend each of the sequences m times using the generative model. Uh, if you generate the end of sentence, you pull it out and put it in another place, and you keep going. You finish with that, you can't go anymore. And it's a competition, so at each step, you order them by your goodness metric, and you delete all but the top end. It's a competition to the deck to see which sentences can survive based on your goodness metric. There is a very simple example just using letters. So let's say your, your Q uh, is going to have two, there's going to be, it's like survivor, right? Uh, two survivors at each round in the competition. And at each uh, round, you're going to generate five new candidates by extending the ones you have. So you start with the start symbol. And let's say you generate five first words. Okay, you take, you apply your metric, and you take the top two, didn't show the rest of them, and you take those, and those go into the next round. Good idea, competition. And then you take each one of these, and you extend it, using your, just what we did in the, in the homework, right? Uh, third homework. So then you, ex, you extend them, and rank, now you're going to have ten in the next round, but you only keep the top two. Right? So in principle, you have m times n at each round. You save the top two, and then those survive. So here, everything's of length one. Everything's of length two. Everything's of length three. You can imagine other strategies, right, where you might have things at different lengths. Right? You only expand certain of them. There's lots of, lots of parameters you can change. But at this point, every, two of them survive. And you always pick the best two. Well, coincidentally, they both ended here. And you pick the best one, which is A, E, D. So what I want to do then is show you So here is my uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's, I set, uh, I use different letters here. This one is going to say 20, you expand by 5, which kind of n-gram. And so you start with 5. This is perplexity, but I think it was the older model that I had. So anyway, you rank them. Uh, Lewis, and this is the brown corpus, same one you use. Lewis, individual, wealth, types, placing. We're off to a good start. We're off to the races. Okay, in round 2... Uh, is that 20? I think so. Welch was. Individual differences. Lewis was. Types of. Types of. Notice that I'm not making this a set. Why not? Well, because lots of sentences could begin the same way. Types of dogs. Types of cats. I don't want to just always start the same way. Right? Lewis could. Lewis did. Yeah, here. Right? Welch wanted. Individual. Right? Now, uh, I generated, going forward, I'm going to generate more of these, but I'm only going to save the top one. I'm always, it's a priority queue, and I'm always going to save the top ones. Round robin, competition, 
who can get the best score. Round three, individual, they're all the same length in this model. Individual differences in types of loans, types of loans, blah, 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 so forth. Now, of course, when you generate the end symbol, you pull it out, leave it, uh, and you just keep going. Welch was wild with individual differences in individual human strength is so forth. Individual differences, constam reactivity, 11, okay. Finish, Welsh was on edge, types of loans, two sentences, <laughs> the same thing, <laughs> right? Welch wanted to know, Welch was worried. Individual help best, individual differences. Um, and you just keep going, keep going, and you end up with, uh, Welch was wild with delight. Lewis himself showed the details. So far, the winner is Welch was wild with delight, right? Now, maybe you just want to find in this search, which is now much broader, uh, remember what's going to happen in your original model is you're going to generate one of these. You're more likely to generate, you know, Welch was wild with delight than individual differences, but who knows? Now, the problem, of course, is that the sentences are getting longer and longer, and sometimes they end up being a little stupid. Like, you, I think you notice this in your models that you created. Sometimes you have these really long sentences with very low perplexity. So the winner so far is individual human strength is needed to make oceanographic data useful on the spot. Okay. Sorry, individual human strength is needed to pit against the inhuman conditions. Individual human strength is needed to inactivate and oh, those are all reasonable things. Okay. Um, when do you stop? Well, here I just did 15 rounds and then I stopped. Um, what could you use though? If Say you wanted to think about what kind of sentence am I producing? The perplexity is saying how syntactically reasonable is this over short compass in the n-gram for the r-gram of larger compass, so fading tail of influence. The n-gram is sort of these rigid windows. The n-gram you can think of it as fading tale of influence going back to the beginning, um, emphasizing the length of the sequence. But it could be a weighted, it could be just about anything, right? Um, you're generating the next sentence, the next word, and you keep going, and you could evaluate the sentence in terms of just about anything you want. I'm not saying everything will work equally well. Perplexity. How likely is the grammar of this sentence? But remember what we did. We've done this a number of times. And it's one way of approaching it. It's a simple way of approaching it. It's not quite right. And that is we ignored length. It's not rational. I mean, not all sentences are the same length. Here is your data. This is why I had you do this, right? Here's your data from the first homework. This is the length of sentences in the brown corpus. We also had uh, uh, the probability of various letters. You can find other statistics. Uh, uh, percentage of verbs, percentage of nouns. You could find a lot of statistical measures of the brown corpus. And our generative model is not likely to fit any of those. All it's doing is generating the next word based on a very limited context. It has no global view of what's happening. So for example, you could take this model of sentence length and add it into the goodness. In other words, either probably multiply or some kind of fat, you know, weighted uh, product of perplexity and length. So now you want to emphasize sentences that follow this distribution. Not quite going to work because you're going 
you're incrementally adding, but it's a start. Um, how about meaning? Is this sentence expressing what I want to express? Is it answering a question? Is it on the topic I want? And there are naive things you can do, like say, I'll rate it very highly if it has certain words, keywords in it. Or it could be the meaning embedded. I want a sentence that says something in this area of the vector space. So what I will do is uh, take the vector space close to where King uh, murdered is, and I will generate sentences that are close to that in vector space. And I will put that in my global criterion, and then the theory being, it will generate sentences that are close to that meaning. In fact, um, these are interesting ideas, but now transformers have transformed the whole, the whole approach. But this is, a, this is a way to think about this beam search. Um, it's not guaranteed to find the optimal sequence in any way, but it is a broader search, right? Instead of depth first, it adds a little bit of breadth first to the search, if you think of it that way, right? It's not completely breadth first. You know, you don't generate every possible sentence, but you are taking it from depth first to, to a wider uh, search. Uh, and for simple applications like this, it works very well. Um, but you need good, you need a goodness metric that is appropriate. And we're going to do something with this on the next assignment. Okay, now that we've um, spent a little time on networks, I wanted to talk about, go back and talk about word embeddings in a little more detail. I think the idea is, in some sense, um, uh, makes sense, and you're, you're, you're doing it in the current homework and get a feel for it. You're, you're doing your own word embeddings, you're using two different kinds of embeddings, you're using word to vec and glove. Um, so I want to I wanna now and I've presented this uh, very briefly before, but I want to talk about it in some detail for the rest of the lecture. So just remember the motivation here, that uh, term frequency with or without inverse document frequency, the problem is they're very long, <laughs> 22,000 or 30,000 for some of you, not sure why. Um, and it is, uh, each word would be one spot would be a one-hot vector in that huge, enormous space. A, um, a piece of text would be a multi-hot, or a frequency vector of the frequency of words. But each word is a, is a separate location. This works really well. Neural networks like this because it's very definite. There's a definite spot where that word is. And the neurons around that word uh, learn how that word works, so there's a lot of locality properties that are very nice. Um, but it's very inefficient, and uh, it's sparse. Most of the elements are zero. It doesn't generalize well. It doesn't encode meaning very well. Everything is separate. Everything is individualized. There's a lot of local information, but not much global information, no global information. So, again, to repeat what I said two weeks ago, we want vectors that are short, typically 50 to 1,000 in our homework using 100, 300, 500, that's, those are appropriate uh, uh, measures, and dense. Most elements are non-zero. So we want to encode the same information, if possible, but in a dense format. This is essentially, this is essentially a dimensionality reduction. You're reducing the dimensionality. And glove is essentially based on the idea that you take the word, word, you know, the co-occurrence matrix and you reduce the dimensionality of it. Uh, pretty much. It's a little bit more than that. But again, to repeat, dense vectors are important because um, there are fewer weights to tune. Uh, the networks are not as wide. Uh, the information is more compact. Okay, they generalize better, you see that, and the one particular thing that there's a real little fly in the ointment here, a real little problem 
with any kind of uh, representation which associates a token with a meaning, and that is synonymy. That is a word, a token, which is the same word which has two different meanings. Wait, lead, mine, road, and lead the way. Lead and lead are spelled the same way. They're the same token in written language, uh, but they mean two different things. They're pronounced differently, right? Um, dense vectors are, and we're going to look again, we're going to look at one in particular. We're going to look at um, word possess in detail. Capture um, similarity much better. For example, hood and headlight. They should somehow be associated because they both tend to occur with car and automobile. Car and automobile should occur next to each other because they're used in the same contexts. Maybe one's a little more old-fashioned and one's a little more stuffy, but they mean the same thing. But in the extended idea, hood and headlight are going to appear near car, so they're going to occur near each other. The hood and headlight and taillight and engine should kind of be similar, right? But in a in a sparse representation, they have nothing whatever to do with each other. There's no indication of similarity. So the idea is to try to capture these kinds of similarities. They tend to just work better. So two classes of embedding. We're going to do, I'm going to focus on word to bet um, today. And there's what are called static embeddings, okay, which develop. Developed first. Uh, Word to Vec is from 2009, I think. It's been around for almost two decades. Um, each word has a unique embedding. That's what you're doing in the current homework. Each word corresponds to a vector. Does not change, that's it. See that that's going to be a problem with polysemy, another term, <laughs> different meanings for the same token. Lead the way, lead bullets. It, you can't deal with that. Okay, you got to live with it. A unique embedding computed from its co-occurrence matrix. So glove, which basically does some kind of PCA computation with a bunch of bells and whistles, um, or what I'm going to talk about today, word to vec. Um, they work really well, but they're static. They don't really. They can't. They can't deal with lesson, right? So there's another kind of embedding that we're going to look at called contextual embeddings. But in order to do that, we've got to go through transformers. We've got to talk more about sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. So we'll do that in two weeks or so. Uh, so I'm going to do static embeddings today. Uh, and you're doing them in the homework, so it's an appropriate time. But contextual embedding, you've probably heard of Elmo or Bert. We're going to look at those after we do transformers. And these. Embeddings are not static. It, you really use context in a much broader way. Um, the, they're a dynamic embedding based on a word's occurrence in its sentence. So in the overall context, you will create an embedding for a word. This is what humans do, right? You see lead the way, you see lead mine or lead bullets. Uh, and you don't confuse the two, you know, if you're conversant with the language. So um, this is a more, this is a state of the art. We'll get to it soon. These are created with these large language models using something called attention that we're going to start to talk about next time. So what we're going to do for the rest of the lecture is I want to look, show you how word to vec works. Globe is a little harder. It's a little less intuitive, so I chose this one. Um, basically, word to vec uses a prediction model. It uses a neural network prediction model in a really interesting way, in a really fascinating way. Uh, a really clever use of this technology. And um, there's basically two flavors depending on which direction you go, what you predict. Okay? But it is, it is a neural network prediction model uh, using softmax, you know, sort of input, predict an output. 
Now, the first one is skip grams. And in that one, you predict the context, you predict the co-occurring words from the target word, the target word being the one you want the embedding for. And then in the continuous bag of words approach, you predict the target word from the context. And you use one or the other. Right? And you train a network to do one of these prediction tasks. Skipgram is something we've talked about a few times. Basically, a skipgram is like an n-gram, except the word that you're predicting for an n-gram in our generative model, we predicted the target word based on the context that came before it. And then we slide, slid it over, predict the next word. Or you measure the probability of the same, right? But in a skipgram, you have context on both sides. Uh, so here's a window size of five. Sometimes I call this a two, two skip gram. Two on the left, two on the right with one in the middle. There's always one in the middle. And uh, so here's a five, a window of five words. Almost always, almost always, uh, you have in the, in the general case, you have the same context before and afterwards, same size. Okay, so the word is in the center. So Claude Monet painted Le Grand Canal. Uh, and so here's a, a window of five. The input word or the target word, let's call it, because in one case it's input, in one case it's output. And then you have the surrounding word. So this is word at time t, t minus one, t minus two, t plus one, t plus two. And you slide it across, just like the did with the end graph. And just like the n-grams, when you're at the edges, you might run out of context, right? And that's just tough. You use as much as you have. So at the beginning, right, for this word, you only have one word of context. Yeah, okay, I know you have to start simple, but whatever you do. Um, for, for at the edges, you don't have as much context, but you use as much as you can. It's just like we did for the, just like we did for the. And here at the end, it turns into a trigram. Right? You only, at the very end, you only have one. So your word is at the end, and you have two, two words of less context. Use as much context as you can. Now, again, again, these are not ordered. And we have this assumption that you have to keep track of that the context is not ordered. So, the skip gram approach, the task is to predict the context given the target word. And what you're going to do is always have pairs of words. This is like your co-occurrence matrix. Your co-occurrence matrix has all the words here, all the words here. Here's your target word. Here are your co-occurring words. And each spot in that matrix tells you how often these two words occur together in the same line in, the, in, your, in 1D. Uh, and it's going to be symmetric. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take pairs of words, okay? Pairs of words. So you're going to take painted as your target word. The word you want to predict is Monet. Painted plot, painted the, painted gram. Pairs of words. Target word, predict a word that is in its context for some size. So remember words of X, what you could do. You could pick the window size. You could also pick the number of occurrences of the word before you consider it. Like that. Also the number of epics, which now will be explained. I didn't ask you to modify that, but some of you have been playing around with it. So you train this to learn the words that are around your target word. So here's, uh, the, it's typically a one hot, okay, a one hot, all the, all the words that come in, uh, it's a one hot vector, here's Monet. So this is your vocabulary. It's, it's pretty much 
learning the co-occurrence matrix. Think of it that way, okay? And so you break up, you break up the data into target word, context word, word, co-occurring word. And you have a soft max coming out. Now this is a very wide network in the input and in the output. But to choose your hidden neurons, okay, we'll get to that. that's a critical step, and we're going to think about that, but you're just going to train in a way that I think you're familiar with on every word with all of its co-occurring words, and it is essentially learning the co-occurrence matrix in the sense that it will give high probabilities the words that occur near each other. So the words in the co-occurrence matrix that have higher counts, it's as if you normalize the co-occurrence matrix. Each row was normalized by a soft max. That's kind of what you're aiming at here. And so uh, this avoids a 20,000 by 20,000 matrix. <laughs> but in principle, that's what you're trying to do. Uh, and then you can see here, Monet Claude, yep, high percentage. After you've trained it for a while, Monet painted, yep, high probability. You're training it to learn the co-occurrence matrix. Now you're asking me, you're thinking, wait a minute. Why do this if you have the co-occurrence matrix? Why are you teaching a freaking network to learn the co-occurrence matrix? If I could just make the co-occurrence matrix. Get to that in a second, but suspense. Um, but in the word to vec, uh, in the word to vec function, there's a there's a parameter called epics. And I don't know what the default. Devin, do you know what the default is? You were playing around. What? For, sorry, for epics. For epics in the word to vec, you were using. <laughs> that was so last week. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, it's fine. Five. Okay, so it's telling. So um, it is doing this iteration through every word with its co-occurring words with five epics. But you could do more. Okay. But again, why are you doing this when you can build a co-occurrence matrix? And the answer is that, um, why I had this here? Oh, oh, let me make one more point before I break the suspense. Um, so then the, the, the result of all this training is then when you put in Monet, what's going to happen? You remember you trained it on individual pairs, but of course it's going to learn all of them. So what, it, what it's going to learn then is something like, that row of the co-occurrence matrix. Computer is going to be very unlikely. Computers and, and Monet don't occur in the same sense, hardly ever. But it's going to occur with Claude and Painted and blah, blah, and all these other words, right? But here's the clever trick. Here's the really, really cool thing. Clever info. How many neurons we're in the hidden layer. I didn't say. Clever teacher I am. I didn't say. Does it matter? Could be 100. Could be 20,000. Could be 5. Now, if it's 5, it's not going to learn much. I mean, there's not a lot of information to learn there, right? The embedding, the embedding size like 100 or 500 or 300, whatever you choose, is the number of hidden neurons. It can be an arbitrary number. And so you can, instead of having this co-occurrence matrix, which has 20,000, right, you can shrink it to 100. It is a dimensionality reduction technique. How much of this is about dimensionality reduction? And check out what happens. This is so cool. If you think about what happens, 
if you put in a one hot vector, say Monet, what's going to happen inside that network? Well, you got all these zeros here. So some, if this is three neurons, right? You have three neurons, and there's a weight matrix in each one of them for each of the inputs. Remember? Say there's three neurons, but each one of them has five inputs for right, five weights for each of the five, right? But these are zeros. So the weights are not used for any but the three weights that are attached here. In other words, the weight for this one, for this one, and for this one. Right? This is the key insight. And so none of the rest of these matter. They all get zeroed out. The only thing that matters when you put that one hot vector in is the three weights that are attached to that input. And that's the embedding. That contains all of the information you need to know to predict the output. When you do a prediction, like here, the only thing in with one, there's, by the way, there's one hidden layer. You don't have multiple, one hidden layer. And that means the weights for everything else are zeroed out. And so this is produced from three weights. You're encoding all the information about this distribution, that row of the table, from three weights. And that's arbitrary. You can make it as wide or as narrow as you want. Obviously, the broader it is, you know, the more neurons and the longer you train it, the more accurately it will approximate the row in the co-occurrence matrix, which is our embedding. Isn't that slick? I love that. Now, um, you can choose any size you want. By the way, this is also, I, I'm, I don't know that auto-encoders are, uh, you know about auto-encoders now? How do you know about auto-encoders? An autoencoder is a way of, uh, of it's again, it's a dimensionality reduction technique. If you have an array of information here, maybe it's an image, maybe it's whatever it is. Let's say it's an image. And you've seen in linear algebra, in our linear algebra class at least, how you can take an image and use PCA to reduce the complexity. You can compress it. Well, you know what you do in an autoencoder? You haven't learned the identity function. You put in the image here, and you put in the image here. And you train it to reproduce the identity function. But you choose the number of hidden neurons. And so you have, I don't know, a thousand pixels and you choose a you know, hundred neurons you're reducing the size the, the dimensionality of the image from a thousand to a hundred because what's in here is the embedding it contains the information you need about that image now here of course it's not the identity it's not an autoencoder but it's encoding this sequence in some number of neurons, so it reproduces, it learns the best approximation of that row in the co-occurrence matrix. I just love this idea. I think it's so cute. Okay. <coughs> you don't need the output. <laughs> you, just need, you just need the embedding. You just need, the, you just need to save the, uh, the, the embeddings are all of the uh, certain slices of the weight matrices in the matrix. Well, there are different approaches. Love is basically taking the 
co-occurrence matrix and using PCA on it. You're right, there's other techniques. There's other <coughs> techniques. They tend to behave a little differently. They're, they're different, they have different, people have experimented with these for years. There's lots of dimensionality reduction techniques. This is, this is one. Do you have something else in mind? Or? Why is this better than other techniques? How big are your embeddings for the do-it-yourself? 20,000. Okay. And they're mostly sparse, so like the general applies back. But they don't represent meaning very compactly. They don't have the right properties. Yes, you can. Absolutely. That's what gloves are. Yeah. That's what gloves are. Yep. With a lot of other bells and whistles. Yep. It's not exactly the same. They all behave a little differently. Yeah. But they're all dimensional. You're absolutely right. They're, they're all dimensionality reduction techniques. And the question is, which works better for NLP? There, there is a variety of approaches. You're absolutely right. But it doesn't mean you should automatically assume that one technique is better than the other. The PCA approach has some advantages, has gloves. Uh, my, uh, Apple has fast tech that uses a different. There's a variety of different approaches. They all have they all turn out to have different advantages and disadvantages. They're all basically dimensionality reduction techniques. Yes. Right. So By eliminating mean, some other information. Let's continue. I, I'm not <laughs> let's talk afterwards. Okay? Let's talk. There's a variety of techniques and people have tried. It just turns out that not all, one size does not fit all. PCA is not, in fact, GloVe uses a whole bunch of other techniques that they throw at it. So the continuous bag of words is a technique um, where you do the opposite. You do the opposite. You're training it the other direction. So, um, now, you, and this almost seems more natural, it seems like a, a, a reasonable extension of the n-gram approach. In the n-gram, you have a prefix and you either calculate the probability of the next word or you generate the next word, how likely is the next word. Now, we have context on both sides. So, now we have prefix, a postfix, and the word in the middle. Um, you could, I've always wanted to do this, and I've never had the time, but you could imagine, you could imagine, uh, after you've generated a sentence, you could take a model of the probability of a sentence is to slide this skip gram over and find the probability of a word given the context on both sides. When we calculated the probability, we just used the, the, the prefix slid it across. You could use it on each side. You can see that you can't really generate that way because you don't know what's after it. But after you've generated a sentence, you could, you could use this to generate a probability that might be more accurate. I've often thought about that. Um, I've never tried it, actually. So you do the opposite. You, you get the, uh, the context, Claude Monet, the brand, and you want to generate you want to predict the target word. That somehow seems easier, doesn't it? Um, so again, you slide these across. Again, when it's on the edge, you don't have as much context. You might need to chop off some of the context. And to train the network, uh, you give it the entire context as input in a multi-hot vector. So here you have a frequency distribution of the context. And you give it the context and then you train it, right? Claude Monet, blank, the grand, blah, 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 blah. And 
you want to predict painted. And so now the training, the data, and the label, it's a multi-hot vector and a one-hot vector, which is the word, you know, so the training instances are going to be all of these pentagrams, essentially, with the one hot, the multi-hot giving you the context, and the one hot being the word in the middle, the target word, and then you train it to predict that target word. But now it's, but it's exactly the same. Having done that, having done that, again, you choose uh, as many neurons as you want, and now you're selecting a different, instead of a, uh, instead of a column, you're picking a row, I guess, uh, of you know, values from this matrix for this layer. I mean, this layer is a, is a matrix. You're picking a row or a column. It's very easy to access to get the embedding from. You're either getting rows of the embeddings or columns of the embeddings in either one of them. Incredibly easy to get them out. So here, you're going to pick the weight that produced the one that produced this. So again, you're training it, and the embedding is just a vector of the weight. Might be my last slide, did I? No, it is. Okay, just a couple more. I'm going to end early. Um, so, in um, in both approaches, we're using gradient descent to move similar words closer together and dissimilar words farther apart. And maybe this is the best answer I can come up with. Because um, it's not clear that PCA does that. Using the dimensionality does not necessarily move closer words together and dissimilar words farther apart. Real time here. That's my first answer here. The PCA might not automatically have that property. So they add a bunch of other bells and whistles, and that's love. Vector. But um, basically what's happening is, uh, say for the uh, skip gram approach, as you do the gradient descent, you're, you're moving, when you have something like apricot jam, the, the jam and apricot are moving closer together. They're learning to be closer together. And Tolstoy and apricot, I guess he didn't like apricot, uh, move further away. And so there's a, a large number of refinements that have been made to this. It's sort of focus on how the gradient descent works. Um, so, for example, um, and they just start adding bells and whistles to it, right? And to little tweaks. And it's been doing this for a long time. One thing is, for example, <laughs> engrams didn't seem like they were that powerful. But they're good at one thing, and that is putting words together that almost always occur together. Like San Francisco. I guess San something or other. Lots of cities that way, right? But Francisco, St. Francis, you know, I don't know. But this is highly likely, that bigram is highly likely to occur together, right? So what they do is they, they, um, they fold frequent n-grams, very likely combinations into the unigram. They just put them together. So that's a pre-processing step. You take San Francisco and turn it into San Francisco with an underscore, literally an underscore. You take X, formerly known as Twitter, and put that all into one. Uh, or, you know, Jim Jordan, Republican firebrand, which everybody says in the newspaper now. Um, 
unindicted co-conspirator. You know, all these phrases that occur constantly together, they would put them to one second. Let me, let me go through these. Uh, they, put these they put these together into a unigram. And that's kind of, it's, it's a low-level processing step that seems to improve things. Um, they also do um, what's called subsampling. So it turns out that uh, when you're looking at these pairs, uh, this is particularly with the skip gram approach, when you're looking at these pairs, you kind of want to do stochastic gradient descent that choose the more common pairs more frequently. In other words, not all pairs occur together with the same frequency. Uh, and so th adjust the sampling probability to probability at the words uh, in the corpus. So um, you, you have some, and there's a formula that they've worked out for doing this. And then <laughs> something called negative sampling. And negative sampling is pretty much based on this idea that you're moving, you're moving similar words close together and dissimilar words further apart. So <coughs> you can basically train it by giving it examples of negatives, so words that are not in context, and adjusting the weights to sort of penalize the network if it, if it rewards that. So, you can, give the, you can give the network a carrot, say, good network, you did it right. Or you can have a stick and say, bad network, don't do that. You can use positive and negative examples when you train. We haven't talked about that. It's not actually that useful in most contexts. But in this context, it turns out to be very useful. You can kind of train the network to recognize words that aren't in the context. Um, which approach is better? Uh, the originators, uh, again, decades, two, almost two decades ago, showed the skip gram approach works well with small corpora because you have more training examples. Remember, we, we broke it into pairs of training sets. Um, and the continuous bag of words shows higher accuracies for frequent words, and it's also faster to train because you have essentially a fifth, you know, the window size of five, you have a, you know, a fourth of the, of the sample. So it, it, it uh, trains faster. And then there's a whole bunch of other approaches, like you mentioned, like GLOVE, which is based on uh, essentially a PCA kind of algorithm, fast text, which is Apple's product. Um, lots and lots of different approaches. Which one is better? It depends. <laughs> you try them. I've had good luck with GLOVE. essentially very similar. So two approaches. Uh, one is to invent a unique token called unknown. Every word gets replaced with unknown. And then you can basically give it some small probability and like smoothing. The other one, which seems completely counterintuitive, is choose a random word and substitute a random word for that. And then it's one example, and it's statistically it's so small, it uh, you train the network. It, it, it feels to me exactly like smoothing. And I don't understand the exact difference between those two. But the problem is you have a word you haven't seen before, and what's its probability? What's its likelihood in this context? What's its likelihood as a target word? You have no information to go on. So you've got to come up with some small probability because. It's an unknown word, you've never seen it, so it's not a common word. It's a, clearly, it's a low end of the probability. So, two approaches that I'm aware of, 
are having this, this unknown given a small probability or given a random instance, which it's also very It doesn't seem like it should work, but it works. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a slide on that. That's good. Okay, let me stop there. Um, I'll try to keep up with, uh, with Piazza. Um, and if you have any questions right now, if you have to look at the code, let's stop. Yeah, but I think that's the answer is that PCA doesn't necessarily compete. The thing that happens with, uh, with, uh, with PCA is the analogical reasoning, like, is to a man, as a queen, is to a woman. You can do those with this, with this method. I don't know that it necessarily works. I got to know that. These are only one. Oh, I see. Um, we're getting there, but I guarantee when I do transformers, nobody knows the 
I understand parts of it. Wow. Yeah. These are all the parts that are kind of put together. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we've eliminated it. Because it's simple. Yeah, right? yeah. This is the way this field is developed. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. 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 I know what I have. I, <laughs> I, should, I should have been paying attention. <laughs> um, this right here, show performance curve. I just, I, I just graphed it. Could you use mine? Which where where's yours at? I put them in the. Uh, they're in the. Um, they're in the. Uh, uh, I I just figured it's the text with uh, the code with my five four. I'll look it down. There's something called performance show performance curve. Okay, that's it. I, I put it in the chat GPT and it was like, who knows that is? So if it's, no, no, it's in the code that I distributed, look up my lecture, my Zoom lecture. And there's, and it's show performance. The reason is it's all now consistent. I also think it's used, you're showing everything in Utah. You're showing the training and the law, the, the training and validation law, and the training and the validation accuracy. And then the test of it. And you know what? It's just a nice way to look at it. Prefer you use that. I can do that. Okay. Uh, are you having all the songs right now? No, uh, but we can go outside. Out of yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to do some other things, but I, I know people are asking questions. Yeah. Let's go outside. So I posted on Piazza last night. Um, and I'm still having trouble. Um, I'm having issues with the graph in one D with the DIY word embeddings. And I'm really confused. I'm just really confused. Yeah, let's look at it. Let's look at it. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you. 